So dopamine is this chemical in our brains that we figured out how to hijack in the modern world. Things like our phones and social media, fast food and alcohol, all of these things spike our dopamine and give us instant feelings of reward and pleasure. But the big problem is that we are increasingly becoming addicted to these factors that cause these huge surges in dopamine. So now we find it really hard to actually do more of what actually matters to us. And so many people in the modern world are just struggling to take action towards what they're seeking for. They're struggling, they have dreams in their mind with their careers or yeah, I really wanna be healthy and they get a little bit motivated for a second and then it crashes. And Society really needs to understand, understand that operating and getting this chemical into balance is what's going to enable you to actually get focused and stay consistently motivated. This is TJ Power. He's a neuroscientist who runs the Dose Lab, which specializes in understanding the four main brain chemicals that influence our day-to-day -day lives. That's dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. We're going to be exploring each one of these in this four-part video series, and there's going to be actionable tips in each of them to help you increase these brain chemicals in a healthy way to completely level up your life. Fingers crossed. So in this video, which is episode one of the four part series, we are talking about dopamine. Let's go. Part one, the law of dopamine. So dopamine has lots of different functions in our brain, but in our reward system, dopamine is the major currency that motivates us to do stuff. As we evolved as homo sapiens, dopamine was the chemical that motivated us to do things that kept us alive which is very different to how we live today. Our brain spent 300,000 years developing them for an entirely different lifestyle. A lifestyle where you had to wake up, hunt for food, build shelter, connect with each other, fight one another. That's what they're designed for. And dopamine was this chemical that lived deep within us that enabled us to take action toward these challenging things that would keep us alive. In our modern world, we basically figured out how to hack that feeling, that hunting or connecting with people or building shelter. And we'd hack it with things like porn and TikTok and cigarettes, alcohol, whatever it may be. And then it goes on to create very big challenges within our dopamine system, specifically with our dopamine baselines. So dopamine is made inside nerve cells called neurons in our brain. We start off with an amino acid called tyrosine, which then gets converted into L-dopa. L-dopa then becomes dopamine. And this dopamine is stored in these vesicles, which are at the end of our neurons. So the dopamine is ready to be released at synapses, which are basically the junctions in between the neurons in our brain and how they communicate with each other. But the really cool thing about this whole manufacturing process is that we make dopamine when we do hard things. And the harder the thing is, the more dopamine we make. Effectively, the chemical evolved within us to be earned. So the whole way in which it operates is that if we do something that is effortful, dopamine will begin to generate in our brain. And dopamine actually operates in little bubbles. They're called vesicles. And any kind of activity that requires hard work will literally manufacture these vesicles in the brain. So if the first thing you do in the morning after waking up is go on your phone and scroll through Instagram or TikTok, then your stores of dopamine are gonna get used up and you won't feel motivated to do anything with the rest of your day. It's like bursting all of these bubbles. Whereas if you start your day, for example, by doing something like exercise or making your bed or going outside, then you'll build up your reserves of dopamine instead of depleting them. And you'll have so much more motivation to work towards the stuff you actually want to achieve. And this is basically the law of dopamine. The law of dopamine is to take action when you wake every day. And what I mean by that is, as soon as you open your eyes in the morning, the most important thing you can do is get moving effectively. Dopamine is literally involved in movement. There's actually this really big phenomenon on TikTok at the moment called rotting, which is where people literally can't get out of their bed and particularly teenage girls call it rotting, where they like cannot move. They can't get out of their bed to do anything. And the reason that's happened is because dopamine is so low from the TikTok and the sugar and so on that they can't take action at all. If you wake up in the morning and you just immediately get the system moving, even if it feels horrible, actually, the more horrible it is, the more dopamine you're going to generate because it operates in terms of that pain pleasure type balance. And if you start adopting that kind of principle, take action when you wake every day. It just means dopamine is on a very good path from the moment you begin. Now, there are two really good questions you can ask yourself to find out if something is good for your dopamine or not. Number one, how quickly does the thing give you pleasure? So things that are naturally pleasurable are gonna slowly increase your dopamine levels and you won't have this massive crash afterwards. But if something gives you a massive hit of dopamine straight away and that feeling of instant gratification, then it's unlikely to be a healthy way to increase your dopamine because it'll just come crashing back down again and you won't feel great. If you suddenly get super high TikTok spike of dopamine, you then put the TikTok down and you're suddenly like, oh, I feel like shit, you're apathetic, you can't take action towards anything. And it's because your brain is just so confused by the unnatural spike that it crashes out effectively. And then question number two is, is this going to benefit me or someone else in the future? 
If the answer is yes, then this is healthy dopamine. Things like cooking dinner instead of eating out, going for a walk with a friend, or smashing the like button for the YouTube algorithm. But if the answer is no, then it's generally not a good healthy way to increase your dopamine levels. And this might include things like scrolling on TikTok for hours, or smoking, or vaping, or drinking alcohol. I am not saying that you're only ever allowed to do things that contribute to personal development in some sort of way, but if we're interested in how to take back control over our dopamine, if you're finding yourself struggling to focus, getting distracted all the time, then it's worth appreciating the role that dopamine plays in this whole system, and maybe like nudging your balance away from instant gratification-y things that just let you experience joy and reward in the present moment, more towards slower things that actually can help improve your life in the long term. If you want, I'm not telling you how to live your life. These are just some suggestions. Feel free to take them or not. By the way, singing with a group of people or doing exercise with a group of people or working with a group of people makes whatever you're doing feel much better. And that is where the sponsor of this video comes in, which is actually me, because this video is sponsored by our own product, Productivity Lab. If you're the sort of person who works from home a lot, maybe in your day job or maybe on your side hustle or your book project or your memoir or your YouTube channel or whatever, and you find yourself sitting at the computer and then not actually doing the thing that you intended to do, then Productivity Lab is gonna be absolutely perfect for you. Essentially, Productivity Lab is an online platform and community of entrepreneurs and creators and professionals, and we all get together and we work together through Focus Labs. We do reflective workshops each week where you reflect on how your week has gone and set goals and plan your next week. So it sort of serves as an accountability mechanism. And I like to think of it as like CrossFit or Peloton for productivity. You're joining a Zoom co-working session with other people. I join these for three hours each morning because I just get way more work done when I'm in a Focus Lab session, knowing that other people are me on screen virtually are also doing their work. And doing this stuff every day pretty much doubles my productivity. And we've had so many success stories from students in Productivity Lab who've said things like, hey, you know, I've been procrastinating on starting my YouTube channel for ages, and then I joined Focus Lab sessions and now I've actually done it. Or things like, you know, I've spent five years planning to make this new iOS app that I've been planning to make, and then I never actually did it, but then I joined a few Focus Lab sessions and now I've built my minimum viable product. And so students in Productivity Lab are getting a lot of good results. There's a link down below. You can check out productivitylab.com and you can see if it's the sort of thing that might be right for you. And who knows, maybe I will see you in one of our co-working sessions or in one of our reflection workshops or in one of our planning sessions or in one of our book clubs or maybe in one of our in-person meetups as well. Part two, four ways to control dopamine. Okay, so now let's look at four actionable ways that we can take back control of the dopamine in our brains what I love about these tips from TJ is that anyone can start putting them into practice as pretty much as soon as you finish watching this video. Action number one, phone fasting. Yeah, so with dopamine, the first thing to understand, the most effective thing we've seen in all of our research and training is this concept we've developed called phone fasting, which is just having agreed times with yourself where you will fast, quote unquote, from your phone. The most important time in your whole life to fast from your phone is when you wake up in the morning. Your brain wakes up, it's seeking for dopamine, it's seeking to attack the day. If it goes straight into the phone, you're really setting yourself on a much more difficult journey. So if you, for example, unlock your phone as soon as you wake up, then probably the best thing to do is to put your phone on charge somewhere outside of your room and use something else as an alarm clock. And then you might wanna do these three things straight away when you wake up. Number one, go and brush your teeth. I hope you're doing that every day anyway, so you might as well do it first thing when you wake up. Number two, splash your face with cold water that helps you wake up and three make your bed and all of this is aligned with the law of dopamine because we are physically taking action and you're immediately increasing these stores of dopamine in our brain instead of immediately depleting them ideally we want to be phone fasting for at least 15 minutes every single morning and then ideally in the evenings we would have 60 minutes of time before bed where we're not on our phones i struggle to do this which is why i have an app called opal they are not affiliated with me in the slightest i wish they were i wish i owned the app or invented the app or something but opal is a great app that i've been using for several months now and it essentially blocks social media apps from 10 p.m. to 9 a.m. Then it's like, if I'm on my phone, I just read on my Kindle and then I go to bed. Easy. It's just massively improved my quality of life by not being physically able to access these offending apps at nighttime. Now, something else I find really interesting about dopamine is that we build up our stores of dopamine when we're bored but we normally don't let ourselves experience boredom because we're always reaching for our phones or whatever device we happen to have on our present. Actually, in a state of boredom, your brain will be generating dopamine. It goes into this like restorative state where it's sitting there thinking, oh, I've got a break right now, so it's gonna build some dopamine. If you constantly just crash your dopamine during your moments of boredom, it's not great for the brain chemical. And this is why TJ recommends that we try and do a two hour phone fast on Saturdays and on Sundays, and to try our best to embrace this feeling of boredom instead of always running away from it. For me, the way I apply this is when I go on walks, I try and avoid having my phone where I'm listening to audiobooks or podcasts or music or whatever. And I keep my phone with me, my AirPods with me, just in case, <laughs> and like a little pocket notebook type thing uh, and a pen. And so if I chill in a cafe or a coffee shop or something or a park bench, I can do some little pen and paper journaling. And I, I like to think that that helps increase overall my dopamine levels over time. Action number two, find your flow. Okay, so I'm gonna quote psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi here. 
Our most rewarding activities are not natural. They demand an effort that initially one is reluctant to make. But once the interaction starts to provide feedback to the person's skills, it usually begins to be intrinsically enjoyable. Now here Csikszentmihalyi is describing the flow state, which is something that he came up with in the 1970s. So when we are in our flow state, we are hyper-focused on that one thing that we're trying to do. And in general, to get into this flow state, there needs to be a match between our skill levels at doing the thing and how challenging the thing actually is. So if something's too easy, then you're likely to feel bored rather than being in the flow state. But if something is too difficult, then you might feel anxious and stressed. And so if you want to get into this flow state, we want to be trying to find that balance between challenge and skill level, and sometimes even artificially adding in a challenge if we feel like something is too easy, or trying our best to reduce our anxiety and stress associated with something if we're putting too much pressure and importance on the thing. Now what's really cool is that researchers have done studies where they scan people's brains to see which areas are the most active when they're in a flow state. And these studies tell us that our reward system and dopamine pathways are heavily involved. When we enter this flow state experience, it builds dopamine in crazy, crazy amounts because our brain's like, wow, they obviously need me right now. You want to think of this dopamine chemical as your friend. And when you're trying to engage in something that's challenging, it's like, oh, he needs support. He needs support. Help him focus. So we know that flow is really common in athletes and artists and scientists because their work is highly skilled and challenging. But we can all experience flow in the more mundane things in our everyday life, like cooking and studying and cleaning, if we find ourselves in these optimal conditions. And on average, it takes about 15 minutes to get into your flow state. So recognize that the first 15 minutes of doing something that might seem a bit boring are always going to be the hardest because that's when your dopamine will be at its lowest. A good example is something like cleaning a bathroom because that's a particularly annoying task in our home. What you'll find is the first five minutes pretty annoying and gradually you begin to what's called gain momentum effectively. After 10 minutes, you might start getting more and more into it. And then what can happen is the opposite can occur. Rather than thinking I can't really be bothered to do this, you actually get more into it than you even expected to. And that's because you're effectively entering cleaning flow state. I find this to be a really useful insight. Like the starting bit of anything that you're trying to do is always the hardest. It's like procrastination is generally a, a difficulty in getting started with a thing rather than in doing the thing. When I'm filming, for example, this is like my, my job these days to film these freaking videos. And the first hour I always spent just like uh, procrastinating, looking at the scripts and thinking, oh, it's not good enough. And thinking, oh, it's not gonna get any views. And thinking, why does anyone care? Thinking, why am I, why am I even qualified to talk about this one? And then when I hit record and just start filming, I, you know, slowly the dopamine builds up over time. It becomes kind of fun. I start like having a bit of fun with it. I start feeling a bit more animated. And like right now I'm enjoying filming this video. It's a fun thing to do. I recognize this was also the case when I was in med school. It was really hard starting to study for the exam, but then once I got into the flow of it, I had my study with me music playing in the background with Pirates of the Caribbean, Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter and the whole shebang. It starts to become fun. So if you struggle with starting stuff, recognize that it's completely normal. Your dopamine levels are low and over time they will increase. All right, let's move on to action number three, which is cold water immersion. And this has actually been shown to cause a somewhat similar increase in dopamine as cocaine. But the key difference apparently is that cocaine spikes our dopamine very quickly in about nine minutes, but then it quickly falls down afterwards. But going into cold water increases our dopamine more gradually over a two hour period. A brilliant psychologist back in 1998 called Ceramic discovered for the first time that cold water immersion can raise our dopamine levels by 250%, 2.5 times. And when you get into this cold water immersion conversation, it's really important to understand this concept called the pain pleasure balance. This pain pleasure balance comes from a really interesting theory published in 1980 by a behavioral psychologist, Richard Solomon, called the opponent process theory of acquired motivation. This basically says that pleasure and pain are opposite emotions states and we need to keep them balanced on either side of a seesaw. So when you eat your favorite food for example and it makes you feel great, the seesaw tips towards the pleasure side but then afterwards an opposite emotional reaction kicks in like guilt if you're like me and you ate a whole mango sticky rice with ice cream yesterday and that guilt tips the seesaw back into more of a neutral position in theory. Now Dr. Anna Lemke is a psychiatrist at Stanford University School of Medicine and she talks about this in her book called Dopamine Nation Finding Balance in the Age of Indulgence. She writes, I tend to imagine this self-regulating system as little gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance to counteract the weight on the pleasure side. The gremlins represent the work of homeostasis, the tendency of any living system to maintain a physiologic equilibrium. And things actually get really interesting because, as Dr. Anna writes, with repeated exposure to the same or similar pleasure stimulus, the initial deviation to the side of pleasure gets weaker and shorter, and the after response to the side of pain gets stronger and longer, a process scientists call neuroadaptation. That is, with repetition, our gremlins get bigger, faster, and more numerous, and we need more of our drug of choice to get the same effect. 
And obviously there's a drug, could be anything that we find addictive like fast food or alcohol or TikTok or whatever. But then the opposite happens when we experience pain first, like going into cold water as TJ suggests we do to increase our dopamine. At first, it's really hard and uncomfortable to stay in cold water, like having a cold shower or doing an ice plunge or whatever. But then in response to the pain, our body activates reward pathways. So the seesaw tips back into balance towards the pleasure side. And the more you do this, the less intense the initial pain will be, but those feelings of pleasure will happen much sooner afterwards and might even be more intense. The most sustainable way to do this is just to every single time you have a shower, have 30 seconds of cold at the end. And that will provide a good natural increase in this dopamine chemical to create a rise in motivation and your capacity to focus. And then the final action, action number four, is what TJ calls my pursuit. And this comes back to the importance of a human always having a very clear mountain that they're climbing in their life. And this was huge for me. I actually was someone that struggled a lot with all of the different addictive behaviors our modern world has to offer. And I had to go through the, clarif the clarification of what am I gonna chase instead of all that quick dopamine. And this is where the whole idea of my pursuit came from, that if you are someone that is addicted to all these different things, really the only way to get off of them is to have something else that you're chasing that you're willing to sacrifice for. If you are doing stuff without a clear mission or purpose or goal in mind, eventually you're just, your brain is just gonna sabotage itself because the brain is very good at recognizing when we are doing something that feels fundamentally pointless. Whereas if you're working towards something, you know, if you're building something or like supporting your family or like whatever the goal is that you're trying to go for, if you have that goal firmly in your mind, it means that all of the stuff you have to do to get there, it feels very directed and it's it becomes quite like fun to do the thing when you know that you're working towards a particular goal. Now, a question I often get asked is, well, okay, but how do I figure out what my purpose is, what my mission is, what my primary pursuit is? This is a whole thing. I have a whole three part playlist about this that talks about how to figure out what you truly value, how to sort of connect it with your own life experiences, how to turn that into goals. That'll be linked up there or down there or something so you can check it out. But TJ's solution to this, which I agree with, is to start spending at least 60 minutes in nature every day without your phone, without music and without a podcast. Now at first you'll probably feel bored and frustrated, but once you push past those uncomfortable emotions, it becomes a lot easier to answer that question of what is my primary pursuit? What do I really care about pursuing? In my case, I personally feel most creative when I'm going out and about on walks in Regent's Park in London or something, or if I'm just walking to a local coffee shop and just sitting there alone with my thoughts. And the more you ask yourself this question, the better you'll get at working out what your goals are and figuring out the plans and systems you've got to put in place to achieve them. This is the whole philosophy called the productivity GPS. GPS stands for goal, plan, and system. This is like a productivity method that I've been cooking up over the last couple of years. If you're interested in finding out more, this is something I teach as part of my product Activity lab link down below, but I'm planning to make more videos about it here on this YouTube channel as well. If you enjoyed this video, then you'll probably like the others in the series that are about oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins, and those will be in this playlist when those videos come out. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you hopefully in the next video. Bye-bye.